do that. Everyone. Hey everyone. Hi Samir. Okay, we'll just give one minute or so for our attendees to trickle in. All right, I think we can get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on wherever you are, uh, whatever time zone you are in. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here. And we are super excited to talk to you all about the ML PhD admissions uh, to US universities. And hopefully our expert panel can give you lots of insights about uh, the admissions process as well as the applications today. Uh, so without further ado, let me just give a quick round of instructions for today, uh, and then we can jump into the actual part of the discussion. Okay. Hopefully you all can see the slides that I'm sharing. Some thumbs up would be good from the panelists. Okay, awesome. All right, so the panel that we have today is about demystifying ML applications to US universities. We have lots of amazing folks here with us today. Tatsu Hashimoto from Stanford, Radha Mihalsia from U Michigan, uh, Devi Parekh from Georgia Tech, Samir Singh from UCR Wine, James Sao from Stanford, and Aditya Grover and me, who are the organizers of this panel. We would all welcome you uh, to this discussion, which we hope would be very insightful and useful to you. A quick round of instructions before we get into the actual discussion. Uh, so the agenda for today will be that a lot of this discussion will be based on the questions that you guys either pre-submitted to us via the Google form that we posted, and we will also take questions from the Zoom Q&A tool. So we would really appreciate if you guys can submit questions live. Uh, we can also pick questions from them. And please feel free to upvote on questions that you would really like the panelists to answer. Feel free to comment on them if you have a variant of the question that you would like to ask and so on. Okay, please feel free to engage. This will really help us get most of your questions answered again as much as possible. Uh, and we will pick your questions to ask our panelists based on the upvotes of these questions that we are getting on the Q&A tool. So uh, please do upvote and comment and engage with the questions that others are asking as well. If and when your question is picked, we are going to call out your name. At that point, please unmute yourself, introduce yourself very briefly, and ask your question clearly uh, so that our panelists can understand the question and answer it appropriately. And just for the benefit of everyone, we would like to inform you that this discussion is being recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube very soon. One thing I want to note is that the videos of all the attendees is already disabled. So none of that will show up in the video stream. If you're not comfortable with your name or your voice appearing in the recording, feel free to use an alias, for example, or just post your questions anonymously. And when we call you out for a question or something, you also have the right to say you don't want to speak up and we can just ask your question, okay? All right, and uh, please be respect respectful when asking questions to our panelists and please frame your questions clearly and please no Zoom bombing. Uh, we would really like this discussion to be uh, a safe and a secure one. And we do want to inform you just for the sake of legalities that we reserve the right to remove anyone from this discussion who is not adhering to uh, the appropriate rules of this forum. Okay, so with that, I would like to just briefly touch, touch upon the agenda for today. Uh, we will start with a brief round of introductions by our panelists, and then we'll go into a couple of teaser questions. And then of course the Q&A starts. Okay, with this, I would like to give it over to Aditya Grover who will be uh, moderating the next part of the session. Thank you. Thanks Seema. Yeah, so let's start with a round of introductions. So I would request every panelist to indicate their name, their 
affiliations, current ones, as well as past ones as a faculty, as well as PhD student, and also their areas of research, and also maybe give some overview of the departments they're recruiting from. So uh, I'll quickly start. Uh, so I am currently a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. I did my PhD from Stanford a couple of months ago, and I'll be joining UCLA as an assistant professor starting fall 2021. I generally work on probabilistic methods for machine learning with the goal of trying to do better inference, better decision-making, and better representation learning, as well as grounding them in science and sustainability applications. Um, I uh, would now like to transfer that over to our panelists. So how about that? So you want to go first? Sure. Um, I'm Tatsunori Hashimoto. Uh, I go by Tatsu. I am an um, assistant professor at Stanford CS, and my I received my PhD from uh, MIT uh, several years ago. Uh, my research areas are in natural language processing and statistical machine learning, and I'm especially interested in questions of how robustness and uh, dis robustness to distribution shifts relates to uh, understanding broadly defined. Um, and I'm recruiting for uh, uh, statistical machine learning and natural language processing at Stanford. Thank you, Tatsu. Rada, you want to go next? Sure. I'm a um, Rada Miharcha, a professor in computer science at the University of Michigan. Um, I also direct the AI lab there. And like that's why I work in natural language processing. Um, my interest within that space is primarily in um, computational social linguistics. Um, and I'm also interested in multimodal processing, which would be um, language plus vision, language plus um, other modalities. Um, and I'm not personally recruiting this year, um, but um, it would be great to have um, applicants apply to University of Michigan in computer science and other departments as we'll discuss in this panel. Thank you, Radha. Uh, how about Devi next? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Devi Parikh. I'm an associate professor at uh, Georgia Tech in the School of Interactive Computing, which is a part of the College of Computing. And I'm also a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. Um, in terms of the trajectory of universities and departments, Adathya, as you mentioned, um, I got my PhD at CMU in the ECE department. Um, I've actually been ECE for a significant <laughs> portion of my uh, career. I was also an ECE undergrad. Um, and then I went to TTI Chicago, where I spent a few years there. Um, and then I was an assistant professor at Virginia Tech, also in the ECE department. Um, and then a few years ago, I moved to Georgia Tech. Um, my background is in computer vision. Um, I've been doing quite a bit of work at the intersection of vision and language, um, some embodied AI, more recently AI and creativity. Um, Thank you, Devi. Samir. Hi, I'm Samir Singh, uh, Assistant Professor in Computer Science in UC Irvine. Um, I guess before this, I was a postdoc at UW and I got a little bit of a glimpse into the grad recruiting process there. Um, and then my PhD was from University of Massachusetts Amherst, uh, where my advisor sort of involved me a bit in the grad admissions. Um, and yeah, my research area is machine learning and NLP. Um, looking at questions like explainability, evaluation, debugging, some of robustness stuff as well. Um, yeah, and I'll be looking for at least one PhD student this coming year. Thank you, Samir. James? Hi, everyone. I'm James So. I am an assistant professor at Stanford, where I am affiliated with biomedical data science, computer science, and also electrical engineering. My group works on developing machine learning algorithms, especially for thinking about human diseases and human health. Right. Um, and I'm also the faculty director for the Stanford AI for Health program. I did my PhD in applied math at Harvard, and then I spent two years at Microsoft Research and also affiliated with MIT. And then I moved to Stanford about four years ago. Uh, and because I'm also affiliated with different departments, the students in my group are also quite diverse. So I'm the you know, primary advisors for PhD students that come from computer science, EE, but also from statistics even from the math department. And I also have, have students from the chemistry and even the medical school. So happy to also to discuss a bit more about the differences across these different departments if people are interested. Thank you, James. Hima? Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, again, thanks so much uh, all the panelists for being here. 
Uh, I'm Hima Lakaraju. I'm an assistant professor at Harvard University. Uh, my primary appointment is in the business school, but I also work very closely with the CS department. I'll be recruiting students this year, both from the business school's PhD program, as well as the computer science department's PhD program at Harvard. Uh, my research interests actually somewhat align with uh, some of the other panelists here. I work a lot on explainability, robustness, and fairness, and also think a lot about the real world implications of each of these, particularly in domains like law and uh, criminal justice and healthcare. Thank you. Thanks everyone for these introductions. So now we'll move on to a couple of teaser questions that we have, which I think summarize a lot of questions the attendees submitted. So the first question we're going to ask everyone is, looking back as a former applicant, what are one or two aspects of PhD admissions you wish you had known before applying? Okay, and just to give some time for the panelists to think, I'll start with one that I remember from five years ago when I applied. So um, I wish I'd known whether faculty at different universities are actively recruiting or not, because especially in AI, it so happens that a lot of faculty these days keep shuttling between uh, industry affiliations or even more generally people, faculty might be on sabbaticals um, and having that information would have been better in terms of me indicating the faculty I'm interested in working with in my statement of purpose. So having done more of that homework or having a place where that information was more easily accessible, I believe would have been more helpful in creating a better application. Okay, with that, um, I'm curious to hear what the panelists have to say. So Tatsu, how about you go next? Sure, uh, I think the biggest thing for me PhD application was a while ago, but um, is about the role of the statement. I really had no idea what that was. Um, and I kind of wish I knew what the role of the research statement actually was. Um, and I think after having done a little bit of admissions, I now realize it's there to sort of, you know, get, get a sense of what you're interested in rather than to really have this like beautiful narrative about what your life story is and so on. And I had no idea that, you know, that was really its purpose. Um, so I wish I knew that before I uh, applied at the time. That's great. Uh, Radha. So before I even answered the question, I forgot to mention uh, my career trajectory in the introduction, which I think it's relevant for this panel, um, that I got a um, PhD in computer science from um, SMU, uh, which is in Texas, Southern Methodist University. Um, and then I was in the faculty of University of North Texas for more than 10 years, uh, where I had a great time and excellent PhD students. Um, in, during that time, I also did a, a second PhD at Oxford in linguistics, uh, which was really just for the fun of it, um, which again is to the point that PhD is supposed to be an enjoyable time. Um, and I miss that learning opportunity. Um, the reason why I also went to do that. Um, and then currently I'm here, which is what I mentioned in the introduction of Michigan. Um, and with respect to what I wish I knew when I apply the first time, um, is first that casting a white net is fine. Um, and hopefully that will also uh, come across during today's conversation. So I will not emphasize that point that there are a lot of schools that really are excellent opportunities for a PhD. Um, and second um, is also having the mindset that PhD is really, I think the best time in a researcher's life with respect to the openness of ideas, opportunity to meet with um, other people. So having that mindset, I think, relieves some of the stress that people have. So it's, it's not really a check that you have to do to have this successful career. It's, it's just a fun time. Um, and that, I think, would help with what Tatsu mentioned in terms of writing your statement of purpose, um, in terms of thinking where to go, like who would be people that you would love to work with, as opposed to, I don't know, I need to go to this place or that place or else. Um, so I think keeping that in mind and trying to have that mindset from the very beginning would help. Like really, this is something that I do for, for my own enjoyment as opposed to um, a check mark that I need to do on my CV. That's very well put. PhD indeed can be a very fun time. Uh, okay, Devi, how about you go next? Um, sure. So. Um, I applied to PhD programs, I think, 15 years ago at this point. So I'm, um, I feel like everybody is much more um, exposed and uh, much like knows much more about what's going on in the area than 
I knew at the time, so it's possible that what I share is not going to be very helpful, but I'll go ahead and share it anyway. Um, I think I had a very um, narrow mindset in the sense that I, I was an EC undergrad, and so I just assumed that the only place to apply are EC departments, because that's what my background is, and it didn't even occur to me that there might be that the fact that there is relevant going relevant work going on in other departments um, is an indication that maybe I should apply to other departments and things like that. So I was sort of very, that I'm an EC, so I'm gonna apply an EC and then I'm gonna look at some rankings and I'm gonna hedge my bets and apply to the top K and then some middle and then towards the end and um, just sort of very, a very mechanical approach to it. And I hadn't, I didn't have the exposure at the time that the things that um, shape your PhD experience is much more the advisor and the lab and the specific projects that you work on and the actual department, whether it's EC or CS or the actual university in a lot of cases um, may not be super relevant, whereas those were the main variables I was thinking about when applying. So I think this disconnect, um, it would have been useful if there was less of that disconnect and if I had um, incorporated just thinking about people and projects and so on in deciding um, where to apply. Thanks, Devi. Yeah, hopefully that's a point which will also come up again in this discussion about which all departments are interested in hiring ML applicants. Uh, Samir. Yeah, so I agree with a lot of uh, sentiments, especially what Devi said, but I'll bring a slightly different perspective that I've seen a lot more as a faculty now. So uh, when I applied, I thought the, the whole process was a lot more deterministic and, and fair and merit-based. And I just assumed people who were good would get more admission admits and people who would whatever way were worse would get less. Um, and maybe probabilistically that works out, I don't know. But being on the other side, I realized that it, it's, a, it's a whole process containing lots of different actors with their own constraints and needs. So for example, if I want to recruit one PhD student next year, um, I probably don't want three students to come in. I also don't want zero students to come in. And so I have to be quite picky about who I admit. And it's who's good combined with what my estimate is of their probability of coming. And, and it all becomes like, that's just me, you know, amongst uh, like maybe tens of places you'll apply to and each with five faculty. So you can imagine the whole process being quite crazy. So, um, yeah, so I think a lot of people like to simplify it and it makes it easier sometimes to uh, deal with the uncertainty, but it's a really, really uh, crazy process that uh, is very stressful as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with the amount of unknowns that exist in the whole system. Yeah, James. Yeah, I really want to also echo the previous comments, I think the PhD process should be really fun and the PhD application process, hopefully you know, it is stressful, but also try to get some enjoyment out of it. Right, so one part of that I wish I had done more of is to actually visit more schools. Uh, by the end of you know, senior year in college, I thought I was tired of all the travels, I only took a few visits. But I think if you really come in with the mentality of these are really great opportunities to meet different researchers, even if you don't go there, it's a great chance to establish networks possible established collaborations. So just try to reach out and talk to and visit as many schools as you can. Uh, also, you know, certainly great to cast a wide net, both in terms of schools and also in terms of departments, because especially for areas that people, like folks here are interested in, such as machine learning and data science, there, there are lots of great research groups, researchers across different departments, right? Um, and when you're looking at schools, it's good to think about more of like a, a community, a research community, rather than maybe a, just a specific PI that you personally want to work with. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I would. I can also relate to how much you learn from your peers in the system as opposed to just your advisor. Uh, okay, Hima. Yeah, so I think, again, all the panelists made a lot of good points, but a few things I just wanted to bring up was, uh, I remember as an applicant being uh, quite stressed out as some of the people also pointed out, 
Uh, looking back, I feel that was probably not the best way uh, I could have spent my energy or time, like maybe adding a little bit of like, you know, some kind of self-care in the process and so on might have actually helped me sustain that uh, for longer. So I think I would really like to emphasize the importance of, you know, think of this as here is a process. Of course, it's kind of intense. There's a lot of uncertainty in the picture. And, you know, some people are recruiting, some people are recruiting for certain positions, like Samir brought up this uncertainty about it's not just about how good you are, but do I have positions? How many positions do I have? What is the probability that you would come in, right? If I make an offer, all this and also your skill set. For example, sometimes if I'm looking for students more with interests in applied ML versus more core ML, or you know, someone else who is working on ML plus HCI I might also look for people with interests in HCI. So it differs a lot. It's not really the results of this process are not really just a yardstick of how good you are. Uh, but I think that is part of like going through this process is basically means you're acknowledging that and accepting that, I guess, just like with anything else in life, right? There are uncertainties, but you do it anyway. But think of it as at the end of this road, you will be in a place with an advisor that, you know, you would really like and you would get to actually do research, which is super fun. So this is a way that you're using to get there. So if you keep that bigger picture in mind, uh, you know, I think the process can get a lot more uh, enjoyable for sure. Great. So this was the first question we had. Now moving on to the second one. So as a current faculty, what are the top two or three factors that you look for in a successful applicant? And we understand this can be a very subjective question. Um, like we just heard in the previous one, there are lots of unknowns and constraints that are involved in the system. But yeah, I would especially encourage all the panelists to highlight some unique aspects beyond conventional metrics like GPA or publications if they can. Uh, I will be recruiting candidates for the first time this, uh, this cycle. So I will be happily skipping this question, but I would like Tatsu to give his insights into it. Um, yeah, so I guess there's the obvious sort of metrics that you mentioned. Um, I think past research track record is, of course, the strongest of sort of things that people look for just generally. But outside of that, I think I'm generally looking for unique mathematical statistical skill sets. Um, often, you know, there will be students that have like mathematical physics backgrounds or, you know, some sort of slightly different ma applied math kind of backgrounds. And that brings a unique uh, skill set and a perspective to the stats ML group. So I'm always actively looking out for those applicants, even if they don't directly have sort of like machine learning and so on. So I think I think of it as, you know, what kinds of unique skills do these applicants have? And does that make up for, you know, any other sort of deficiencies or like the fact that they're transferring in to uh, machine learning? Thanks. That's it. Rada? So, um... Since you mentioned looking beyond sort of the metrics that come across um, through numbers, um, I generally look for genuine interest um, in NLP. And that, of course, like you said, it's very subjective. Um, but really trying to find applicants that are not after necessarily getting a PhD as their main objective, but really learning more in natural language processing. Um, one way to see that, for instance, is I'm always impressed by the number of languages that somebody speaks, um, which is not to say that people should now rush and learn more languages before they apply. Um, it's just one way of seeing genuine interest, like somebody who really loves languages and is into that. But there are so many other ways to see like genuine interest, and that's something that I'm looking for. And then the other thing, which is even more subjective, um, and sometimes it's hard to get from the application, it's coming across more from an um, interview process is general attitude. Um, over the years, I came to value more and more the attitude of a student toward research, which is this positive constructive attitude toward solving problems. Um, and that to me really matters. Um, and again, it's, it's highly subjective. I feel that it would be a better fit with my current research group in terms of having, even if you don't necessarily have a, the background on a certain problem, but having that attitude that, yes, I can do this, I'll put in hard work and I'll eventually come up with a solution. Um, that's something else that I'm, I'm looking for. 
Thanks, Radha. Devi? Um, yeah, so a few things that I tend to look out for, again, in addition to the more usual things. Um, one big thing for me is um, communication and clarity of thought. Um, and yeah, uh, some amount of maybe self-reflection, but basically just some signal that this is a person that thinks things, thinks, thinks things through um, and thinks somewhat linearly and there isn't sort of a jumbled up uh, notion of thoughts going on. So that's, that's one big thing for me. Um, another is some sign of having um, a tendency to sort of get things done. Um, and this can come across in various aspects of the application. Um, a third thing would be um, attention to detail where if someone has released some code, it doesn't have to be like a big research code or anything, right? Even if there's something small they did, if it was a class project and they put it out on GitHub, um, I might go through, click on the readme and just sort of looking at whether this person was trying to have something somewhat polished out there or was it just sort of a dump of things so that you can just say that, oh, I have my code on GitHub and then you move on from there kind of thing. Um, so these are a few things that tend to stand out to me. Thanks, Devi. Samir? Uh, Samir, can you unmute yourself, please? Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'll elaborate a little bit more on Devi's point of communication because that, that's one of the most important factors for me. Um, I definitely talk to every candidate that I'm even considering. Um, and I, I try to see, you know, a lot of PhD advising is going to be having those conversations for five, six years. Um, does my conversation with them come even close to what I enjoy in terms of discussions? Are we being uh, critical, self-reflective, uh, thoughtful about anything, right? And usually I let the student uh, pick what they want to talk about because at this point I shouldn't pick for them given their background may not be sufficient, uh, but are they able to have that conversation, right? Um, and I try not to let language issues and things like that be barriers in these conversations. It's a lot more about um, uh, being a little bit more critical. Um, the other thing I would say, which hasn't been covered so far, is um, I like to have more context about uh, the students' uh, students' weaknesses and strengths. So I, I try to look for that in the personal statement, in the sense that, okay, maybe uh, they haven't published yet, but is there a, a reasonable narrative about their attempts at doing research or taking initiative to do something new? Uh, is there any evidence of their curiosity and, and awareness of how what the research process looks like, even if they don't have publication? So thinking of, I mean, it's not always scalable, but thinking of this as a whole uh, whole package and, and taking some kind of context into account is, is valuable for me. Thanks, Samir. James? Yeah, so in addition to the qualities that other people mentioned, like technical strength and communications, um, I think one thing that really helps us when we look for candidates is are, do people have a real interest in having deep and broader social impact in the research that they want to do, right? And I think that means like, you know, going beyond how many papers they want to publish or even where they publish those papers, but are they really interested in some really deep problems, which could be sort of foundational problems in machine learning, or it could be problems that we think would, if we solve those problems, could have transformative social impact. Right. Um, so we're really looking for students that really want to sort of be very ambitious and you know, certainly have the technical skills, but really have the, the attitude to go after these big and deep problems. And as a part of that, I think you know, one th intangible that ends up being quite useful is you know, do the students have, are they resourceful, right? In the sense of, um, you know, would they be able to do whatever it takes, right? To grab different tools from different communities and maybe they have to run simulations, maybe they have to prove theorems or come up with approximation algorithms, but you know, that oftentimes you have to be resourceful in leveraging different tools and developing new tools to solve these big problems. Thanks, James. Gina? Yeah, I think uh, apart from all the amazing insights that other folks have brought up, I think I rely on a couple more things. I also look for uh, at least some evidence. I also do a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews for the candidates that I'm uh, seriously considering. Uh, and I do look for, as James said, like resourcefulness is something that I really look for and also 
potential evidence for some kind of perseverance because as we all know this journey is uh, you know it's not really uh, you know going to be like without any ups and downs so like people need to uh, persevere when needed and like keep going in spite of some roadblocks at various points so uh, that is one thing but yeah I do I think uh, the packet for me I typically look for uh, background skill set as well as uh, research interests the things that I try to look for in the packet are is someone actually genuinely interested in the kinds of problems that I work on uh, and you know is that interest coming from a genuine place as well as like is there evidence in their research record or whether it is you know doing some projects as Devi said putting out some code or even doing a class project or even you know workshop papers or pay any of this thing so I look for that interest in what I work on or like problems related to what I work on this perseverance and in the personal chats that I do I actually do what Samir was also hinting at which is basically I try to assess how much I enjoy having conversations with those students and you know if we are able to sort of uh, bounce ideas off each other discuss things seamlessly or of course we don't expect everything to fall in place right in the first conversation so sometimes I have also uh, done like two meetings with people where we discussed a particular paper that we both read and things like that uh, so yeah I use this entire piece of like information both packets and personal interviews to uh, figure out if it's more about a fit I would say more than like me assessing if someone is good or not that's really not what is happening but it's more about like if we are a good fit to be a colleague uh, you know good colleagues or not that's what I look for. Thanks Seema. So this was a great round of questions hopefully it answers a lot of uh, concerns our applicants had or general curiosity about the whole process. And now we'll take some live questions and I'll hand over to Hima to, to moderate this. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Aditya. So one thing before we go into the live questions that I would like to uh, point out to people is that uh, from here on, not everyone uh, needs to answer every question. I think just in the interest of time and the questions we have, uh, we are hoping that a couple of you can field each question. So if you hear the question from uh, you know, the prospective student and if you feel you have thoughts on that, please just unmute yourself and speak. All right, so uh, I would like to call on Dvija, Dvija Parik. Dvija, if you could unmute yourself and ask you a question. Hi, uh, my question is, how do you review specific uh, applications from undergraduates as opposed to people who have masters or industry experience or any kind of research experience? And what kind of research experience would you be looking from from an undergrad? Anyone, any panelists is up for, oh, Radha, yes, please. Yeah. I would say just following up what, on my earlier comment, I think publications are important perhaps nowadays more than before, just because it's, um, to be fair, it's getting fairly competitive. There is a large number of um, applications that um, are received, but I really try to get more um, like research experience and acknowledging that the master student has had more time to have that research experience. Um, so publications are always welcome. I don't think I necessarily look for um, like whether is the top conference versus say second rank conference. Uh, it's more about being interested in, in research and um, participating in the research process. Having had the publication usually means that you interacted with the team, that you thought about the problem. Um, that you went through the process of writing that paper. Um, so to me, it's more, more about that as opposed to um, where that paper has been published or how many such papers have been published. Um, and I also look and almost at the same rank in my evaluation for research experience. So even if there hasn't been a paper that came out, there are sometimes these um, research experiences that are mentioned either in one CVs or in the statement of purpose that I work on this project and has done this and that. Um, and I, I consider that as well. And so I have had students whom I'm, um, I'm now having the opportunity to work with whom I'm uh, admitted and they haven't had any publication when they started, um, but they, they had the research experience that was coming across from, from their application. Any other thoughts from any of our other panelists? 
Um, I guess one thing I'll add is I, I end up looking at letters a lot more closely when it comes to undergrads, uh, partly because since they don't have publication, I guess they don't have the stamp of approval from the community. Uh, but, but it's very inf insightful to see what the professors and the advisors say about the student and maybe they compare them to their own PhD students and that could be a pretty valuable um, signal to me. Uh, the other thing I also look at is evidence of, I guess, scholarly activity, even if it's not paper. So examples of those could look like, you know, just I've seen lots of people maintain blogs um, about papers and research ideas or tutorials on like, hey, Max, like you heard something, something. Um, or I sometimes look at their GitHub repos to see what they've been doing. There are students I've seen who aren't publishing, but they're trying to reproduce papers or, or do something, uh, things like that. Uh, that is also uh, can be insightful. So yeah, you have to dig in for a few other signals uh, if you don't have papers, but, um, but yeah, I need to do that more with undergrads. Uh, so I think this question also closely relates to a pre-contributed question we had from the Google form. A lot of folks have actually asked, is there a difference in which how you would assess or evaluate an undergrad application versus a master's uh, student's uh, application? Like, or do you distinguish at all or do you evaluate them in different ways? If so, what are those different ways? I was actually just going to say that, and this may not be broadly applicable, it might be just me, but I actually don't make that much of a distinction. I think the thing that I'm looking for is some sort of past evidence of whether it's publications or projects or the other signals that Samir was talking about, but it actually doesn't um, pop out to me as, it's not that I make a pile of undergrad applicants and then a pile of master applicants and then have different expectations somehow. I think it's all just a pool to me. And whether or not someone did a master's or worked somewhere, um, I tend to think of it just as sort of a life choice that people make. Like some people maybe decided new early on that they want to do a PhD. Some people decided that they wanted to get some experience and then do a PhD. So I think of it more as just a choice that someone made as opposed to evidence of more readiness necessarily in some way for the PhD. So I actually don't end up making much of a distinction between those. So our next question is actually from an anonymous attendee. So I'm going to read out the question. So I think this time, particularly, a lot of schools are indicating that GRE is optional. Uh, would it be still better to submit a score? And in general, how do you guys view scores like GREs uh, as well as GPAs? Do they figure anywhere in your decision making process? I can talk about the Stanford version for this. Um, I believe GREs are optional for Stanford. Um, and I have never heard of a case where someone said, uh, you know, they didn't submit their GRE, this is a negative signal. Um, in fact, the only time I have heard the GRE ever come into a decision is if the GRE score submitted is low, then it raises a warning flag. And then we usually email the letter writer to ask, you know, is their verbal or mathematical skills actually okay, even with this GRE score? Um, so it generally doesn't work towards in your favor. Um, the only scores that actually seem to matter is the TOEFL, which I believe is required for um, certain foreign students. And if that score is low, we will actually follow up and try to figure out, you know, whether or not there's going to be communication problems. Um, GPA is, you know, part of the holistic evaluation process. So we always look at that. Right. And just follow up on Tasu. I think Agree. So the GRE, it's, it's only a warning flag. Um, GPA, I think it's a little bit more important, but mostly it's also a bit, bit like a warning flag. Like if you got a B in linear algebra or in statistics, then maybe you want to take a deeper look to say, why, why did that happen? Right. Um, but otherwise, um, I think those do take more secondary roles compared to your research experience, uh, the letters and your interview. And uh, just to kind of add another very uh, related question uh, from our pre-contributed questions, people have asked that, can research experience compensate for uh, not so stellar grades? Like let's say someone has a B in one of the subjects that you mentioned, James, but they do have like maybe some publications or other stellar research experience, can that compensate for the not so stellar grades? In my experience, yes, absolutely. Um, and oftentimes you know, there, are, there are good reasons for why people, especially early on in their college, maybe they get lower grades, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we often make allowances for that, especially if you show that you do have the technical skills based on the, the research papers and the, the letters. 
And uh, next I'm going to call uh, Pinogiotis. Let me unmute you. And sorry, uh, Pinogiotis, can you please unmute, unmute yourself and ask your question? I think you're still muted. Not here. Okay, so let me just kind of mention the question uh, more generally. So uh, people are asking that when you write about your research interests in your statement and so on, how focused should the research interest be? Uh, for example, can it be as broad as I want to work in machine learning or computer vision, or does it need to be a lot more specific for you guys to get an idea of what people want to do? Um, maybe I can answer that. So at least for me, um, I don't especially, so I, I like the statement, uh, the personal statement to be focused. Um, so I, I'm interested in whether you're able to ask questions that are interesting to me, uh, that are relevant in the current research scenario, uh, are actually something that could become, that could look like a dissertation. Uh, but I'm also very well aware that as soon as you start your PhD, you're going to learn so much more than you did when you were applying that none of those things may matter anymore, right? So, so I'm more interested in, are you able to communicate a single idea, a valid research direction and a focus rather than specifically what that focus might actually look like, but that may be just me. Yeah, maybe I can say something on that because maybe I have a slightly different um, way of looking at it than what just Samir said. I think in, in the question, at least it said that the person is interested in computer vision in general, and they don't know exactly what they might want to do. So I think I would much rather have a genuine statement that just says that, that look, this is the space that I'm interested in. Um, I don't know what exactly it might be, than someone trying to make their interest more focused or make it seem like their interest is more focused than it actually is. Um, and maybe one thing that you could do is to maybe talk about what kinds of things have excited you in the past that you don't know what it is that you want to do in the future, but here's something that I came across and this is why I thought it was interesting. Or these are the kinds of projects I've tended to enjoy in my, whether it's undergrad or whatever it is that your background is. So maybe you can try and bring in some focus um, in terms of the kinds of things that excite you, even if it is not focused in terms of the specific technical problems that you want to work on. Um, and that might be one way in which the potential advisor or committee can get to know you a little bit better because the danger of having something very generic is that it, if it doesn't give any signal, right? If the committee or the potential advisor feels like they don't know you any better after reading your statement than they, know, than they knew you before, then that's problematic, right? So that's, um, there might be other ways of conveying that signal beyond the technical focus. Yeah. One more thing that I just want to add uh, is there's a danger to uh, being too focused. Um, you want to you know, convey the fact that if you are willing to work on multiple things and not just like the really narrow thing that you wrote, because sometimes there will be like a really great statement, but it'll be about such a narrow area and the person that's interested in that is not hiring. And then that's really problematic because it's difficult to make decisions in that case about whether or not to like, you know, will this person change their research area if they come here? Um, so you do really want to like make it clear what you're willing to work on. Like even if your research thus far has been focused and like you're willing to write about the focus there. So we are getting lots of anonymous questions. So I'm going to read out the next most upvoted one. Uh, so one of them is asking that given that the number of applications that universities get is in the order of several thousands, uh, or maybe at least a thousand, uh, what is there like a desk rejection that happens, which is, you know, everyone who does not meet this cutoff of GPA or GRE does not even make it to review by professors and also in schools where hiring is mostly committee driven, does it imply that there would be more stricter rules uh, regarding quantifiable things like GPA? I, I could start um, perhaps by saying that, and this might be um, institution specific. Um, so we do look at all applicants mm -hmm. um, and that's where also it's important to have some kind of in indication of area of interest. It could be as broad as I'm interested in AI or ML, which is broad at this point. Um, and then based on that and going through um, the interest of an applicant, we map them uh, to faculty. So eventually, even if there are hundreds or even like over a thousand applications, 
the number of applications that one individual faculty or research scientist would get to review is much smaller than that. And so um, every application will, will get reviewed. Um, and then eventually for those that are selected as the most promising, given the current setting of um, which faculty are looking to get new students and other factors like that, um, for the top applicants, there will be a more involved process, like more people looking at those applications and um, of course, getting also to the point of an interview. And I would also like to take the point, it's not the question what the question is asking, but I do think it's very important to send this across um, that it's true that there are thousands of applications, but that's primarily true for top schools. And there is this curve of like a lot of people hoping to get into a top school, uh, but there are really a lot of excellent PhD programs. Um, and having served myself on the faculty of two schools at different ranks. Um, so I was for many years at University of North Texas doing what I do now, uh, I was still the same person. So it's still getting the same advisor. Um, now I'm at Michigan and the students, I had many amazing students who graduated from University of North Texas. They are now research scientists in various places, leading teams at Google, whatever your dream career could be. Um, and they graduated from, from University of North Texas. And I think keeping that in mind, so don't go with the wave that I have to go into this I don't know, top 10, 20 schools or else. Um, and there are other schools that they would not have thousands of applicants. Um, so there, if you consider for instance, University of North Texas, but there are many, so many other schools. Look at the faculty, what they do. They do fantastic research. And if you think you would enjoy working with that person, go through the same process. Um, and it will not be the same. So there will be thousands of applications, maybe, I don't know, there are hundreds or even, even less. Um, and so keep that in mind that when you apply, don't just go with the wave and say, I want top 10, look at potential advisors. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts? Yeah, just to say that, uh, agree with that 100%. I mean, the, the missions process at Stanford is also quite similar to what Radha described. I think every applicant will get read, even though there are thousands of applications. But you can think of that as sort of like maybe a three layered sort of triaging process where in the first layer, everything gets read maybe by perhaps one faculty plus maybe some current existing PhD students. And the ones that makes it to the next layer will get read by maybe two or three faculties or members of the admissions committee and then there's this further tracking of people to get, who get interviewed. Um, and also just to add that because there are so many applicants, um, the process is quite random. Um, there are some sort of randomness to it, right? especially in the last two rounds of filtering. A lot of that, unfortunately, does depend on you know, who's reading your file in particular, um, who happens to be on the missions committee or who's in the room in the, when the discussion happens. Right? So there are many good students that, um, that maybe you have a certain bias in your coin, but it's not gonna be like, uh, you know, uh, there's still a fair amount of randomness in the process. Uh, at this point, I would like to call upon Varun Khare who had a related question. Varun, if you could please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thanks, Hima, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I wanted to ask how much does an internship with the professor helps when the student wants to take the PhD under the same professor, like uh, in terms of committee decisions and everything? Yeah. And uh, just to add to that question, there is also another related question, which is a bit more broader, which is what type of relationship should an applicant cultivate with professors or schools of interest before applying? Uh, and what is a good way to cultivate this? Thanks, Varun. I can give a bit of input, I guess. I mean, in terms of the internship question, at least at Stanford, if I say, for example, I want to take a student and I'm willing to fund them, you know, I can sort of get that student accepted. But that's a really high threshold, right? Like, because normally we accept students by committee and we don't make commitments about, you know, hiring students individually and funding them. And so if you have an internship 
and your professor really loves you and wants to hire you, then yeah, like that's going to really help. But that's also an exceptional circumstance. Like the, the median outcome is something like you work with a faculty, you're like reasonably impressive. You get a letter from them that says, you know, this was a good student and like you should take them and that's going to help your case, but it's not going to be, you know, this like slam dunk thing. And in some cases it can be harmful um, in that, you know, you get compared to other students and then suddenly maybe you don't look as good if, you know, um, you had a bad time at the internship, even if you had a lot more sort of skills in other places. So you have to really think carefully about, you know, can you succeed at the internship? It's not just about like getting to know somebody and like some personal connection kind of thing. It's really about um, being able to prove that you're really able to do research uh, in the opportunity that you get. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts on this? I guess I will also add to that that it, internships can help again if it's successful and the letter reflects it not only for that institution that you intern in but for general area as well I think I value letters a lot and if you're doing an internship with a professor it's likely that I might know know them or recognize their name and when I look at the letter so that can be helpful as well yeah so another related thing that a lot of people ask is does it help to email professors beforehand or does it really affect your chances at all in any way Right. I would say for that, I think just the uh, generic kinds of emails would not really help or would really impact your decisions. If you do write a more thoughtful, focused email, let's say of the flavor, oh, I've read your this recent paper, I have done something similar, uh, and here are some potential interesting questions or ideas, right? So a more focused letter email like that could lead to additional conversation that could be helpful. Yeah, and I, I think, yeah, I completely agree. And I think this, I think students are getting this advice that don't send generic emails. But I think I see a lot of emails where there are slots where the titles of my papers have been plugged in, where any, anybody else's titles could have been plugged in. And I don't think that helps in terms of it being any less generic. Um, so I think, yeah, in most cases, most of the emails that I tend to get don't make um, any difference, to be honest. Um, there are some emails that stand out and then in that case it helps. Um, but yeah, anything that can be a whole separate session on templates for these emails and how most of them are too long, too generic, they don't convey any information, but I think that can be a whole other conversation. And just to quickly add to that, um, I very much agree. Um, and I would say, so when I'm asked this question, I say if there are people whom you absolutely love to work with them, then do go to the process of careful reading their work and relating and probably you've already done because that's why we, you want to work with them. And so for those handful of faculty, I think it's worth trying to make that connection. Um, but otherwise trying to reach because it could be daunting to try sending to, I don't know, 50 different people this very thoughtful email. It's very hard. So just I would say if you really want to do that, maybe two or three people whom you would really want to work with and send that very thoughtful um, attempt to connect, it might be worthwhile, but otherwise I very much agree that um, it, it doesn't help. Yeah. So one other pre-submitted question that we have is, uh, so folks from international uh, countries, other countries, non-US countries also apply. And you know there might be an advantage for students who did their undergrads in US because they get research experience, maybe some publications, uh, but this puts people from you know developing countries and so on at a disadvantage because they might not have access to the same resources. So do you look at these two kinds of applications a bit differently? If so, how? So I, I, say, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was going to say this for the uh, GPA question a little bit where um, I do think I look at things a little bit differently in places where I have context. So for example, in India, um, I know that everybody or a lot of people sort of take this entrance exam and then based on the rank, you essentially get mapped to an institute or a major. And I know a lot of students don't actually enjoy the major that they ended up that they end up spending four years in. Um, and so I know that people often make a choice where this is not what I enjoy. I'm not going to spend time on my courses and I'm going to do all this other interesting things on the side, in which case their GPA may not be great, but then they have these interesting projects or these um, sort of software labs that they were a part of and have done amazing work in and so on. Um, so I do tend to have that lens when I'm evaluating applications for, for example, from India, where I'm aware of this context. And so that makes a difference. Obviously, I don't have this context from all countries in the world. And so there is potential for bias in some ways um, in doing this, um, but I, I do take that into account. What I was going to say is that I do 
um, account for that in my own evaluations with the view that in terms of resources that one has, um, it's actually playing in the favor in my internal ranking, the favor of the person who doesn't have resources. So to me, that says that they are really keen on research and really interested if say, when they lack resources, they still manage to do something like for instance, engaging on a research project or doing something that's interesting. And again, it's not about, oh, did they publish in this top conference or not? That actually matters even less. And I, I would always consider that. And it's like that we said with also keeping in mind how much knowledge I have, but in my own way of judging is not at the detail level that Devi mentioned, it's more at the higher level. So I know say people coming from this place of the world tend to have less resources, um, then I would evaluate them differently in the sense of really giving them credit if they manage to do something. Uh, one thing I quickly want to add to that is the resources is a key keyword here because I think there are also international places, universities which have more of a history of producing research and publishing in the top venues and students there are not same as someone else from the same country. And similarly, even at the US institutions, I, I often see students from liberal arts colleges and, and small you know, departments where they don't have a culture of as much research. And so I have tend to evaluate those students. Uh, those are my two buckets, I guess, how, what kind of place they were in, yeah. Right. Uh, so just for the benefit of everyone, I would like to remind people that uh, we'll be continuing until 1.15 p.m. So that's the uh, actual time when, uh, you know, we have the panel until, but if any of our panelists is interested to stay back, me and Aditya will, of course, stay back for a little longer. Uh, so anyone else who wanted to talk can also uh, talk to us, or if any other panelists are interested in staying back, please feel free to do so. Uh, with that, I think I would like to kind of, uh, you know, turn gears and ask one, again, very popular question that has come up in different ways uh, on our pre-submitted questions list, uh, which is, how does one justify the financial and emotional costs of doing a PhD? Uh, you know, people ask that, you know, you spend five years doing a PhD, you forego an industry salary, and they also see on, you know, higher ed articles and so on that the depression rates are higher among PhD students. So given all this, how does one consolidate the view that, oh, doing a PhD is a great idea? I can, again, start. Um, and I'm, again, often asked this question, particularly when I talk to undergraduate students or master students who are considering should I do a PhD or not? And I think this is really an investment you do in yourself, like a time investment. So you can regard it that way uh, because there is payoff. And the way I see this is by doing a PhD, you really place yourself on top of the world, intellectually speaking. So from there you can pick and choose what you want to do next. So there will be at least certain doors will be open only if you are in that position. Um, so it's um, also with respect to what I mentioned earlier that it's really a very enjoyable time if you have that mindset um, of enjoying this um, richness of ideas. So I think that will be um, in my view seeing like you really need to see in the future because if you compare the salary you get as a PhD student with the salary that the company would pay you, it's clear uh, which one wins but you have to see in the future, uh, like say five years down the line, what would I get to do? What kind of roles will I have if I have a PhD versus not? Even financially, if you think that way, like what kind of salary will I have in five years if I have a PhD versus not? And doing those calculations sort of almost across a career in terms of what you do versus just now, like today, how much money do I get or what do I get to work on? Any other thoughts on this? I'll also just add that um, I really enjoyed my PhD experience. I thought it was really one of the best few years in my life. Um, and partly it's because it's, you, it's really one of the few times where you really do have the intellectual freedom to take all sorts of interesting classes, talk to some of the most interesting people and really work on your own research ideas, research agenda, which is even in industry, uh, it's still very hard to do even at some of the, the best companies, right? Um, and I think that's really what it comes down to is, are you really interested in, in having this flexibility and freedom to do some deep explorations about your own research ideas? Right? And it's not really 
uh, the case for everyone. That's perfectly fine um, to you know if that's not something you're interested in, then perhaps PhD is not the best investment, the best option. But if, if that's, that's something you are passionate about, then I think PhD, despite its limitations and low salary and the stress, is still the best opportunity to, to do that. Okay, uh, so I think I'll now hand it over to Aditya, but I'll start, I'll stop with the question. So one of the other popular questions that came up was, if you have one or two years to prepare for a PhD application, what are all the things that one can do during that time to make their chances of getting into a good PhD program or one of their choice better? I guess it's hard to answer that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. You can go ahead. No, I was just gonna. Yeah, I was gonna say that. I think it is. It is hard, but I think the most, the first thing that comes to mind is um, trying to get the research experience, right? Trying to like do what you would be doing during a PhD, um, and trying to get a flavor for it and see how. And it's also a good way for you to figure out whether this is something you enjoy, right? That um, if you do get this research experience, you might realize that no, this is actually not what what excites you. And so it's sort of information gain in, in both directions. Um, yeah. And just following up on that, uh, Devi and others, so people often ask that if they're working in the industry, what is the best way for them to get research experience? Should they reach out to professors and start working on some collaborative projects or like what can they do if they're already in the workforce in the tech industry, for example? Yeah, so I think um, obviously time is an issue, right? Like if you already have a full-time job and then you're trying to do this um, on the side, so it, it would be a personal decision on how you want to juggle that and so on. Um, but outside of that, I think reaching out, um, I, for example, have collaborated with someone um, who, who has a job and they, we had common interests and we had a publication out of that and so on. So I think that's one option. The other is um, I think Samir kind of brought this up that um, like re-implementing a paper that already exists. And there are these reproducibility challenges now that have some structure around it. It was first around I clear papers. I think it's much broader now. Um, and so participating in something structured of that sort could be one way where even if you don't have a close collaborator, it just gives you some structure to work on something. And then you can talk about it and put your code out and um, things of that sort. Um, I think even online classes, I know that gets talked about a lot. But if you do sign up for a good course, follow it through, um, I think that can give you a lot of the tools that you then might be able to use in projects and um, talk about that in your application. And I would add, it's really on the same line of trying to get some research experience. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean you need the one, two years um, to prepare for that. But I think attending events is also worthwhile. And that doesn't mean you have, again, a conference, like a paper in a top conference. You could, for instance, have a paper in a workshop or not even have any paper at all and still attend um, conferences. And nowadays, for instance, in, in NLP, many of the conferences have these mentorship sessions. So it's really about getting to know people and getting people to know you and interacting, but all these like in a meaningful way, as opposed to let me get to this faculty from this top place and I really want to talk to them um, it could be peers like other students who are already in the PhD program uh, that can provide insight. So keeping that in mind, and I realize it can be very difficult at first. Like if you are finding yourself in a large conference with lots of people, you don't know anyone or what, um, but try to go from those like places that have smaller interactions. And again, speaking for NLP, they are specifically designed mentorship sessions where you get to meet people. There are workshops, which are smaller groups. They are like birds of a feather. So try to get ways to interact and this is the virtual world in a sort of normal in-person world just go and have a coffee and start talking to the person who's also having a coffee and you don't know what strikes from there one thing um that i want to add to both of that is sort of the the reasoning behind um why you would want to have research experience i think a big thing that we often mention in when reading files um, for stanford is calibration so we'll, we'll often get um, files that are like, this is the best student at this institution in like five years, but it's hard to compare them um, to the other uh, great cases that we have because, you know, if they haven't published and they don't have letters that compare them explicitly to other students, like we just don't know how, you know, how, how much more exceptional you are um, than the upper bound of what we've seen. Um, and so research experience and letters both allow us to have a sense of, you know, 
is this student as good as a typical PhD student at this other institution? Um, and so all of this, I think, if you can get some way of calibrating um, what you've done to other students, that sort of provides sort of a lot of um, information for us making decisions. Great. Agreed. Um, now, another popular kind of question that's coming up is this question of advisor versus the university branding and how would these kinds of decisions affect the kind of job prospects, both in academia and industry post your PhD? Anyone would like to take that? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll start. So I think the, and I think everybody might agree with this. I think the advisor matters way more than the university. Um, I've been in places uh, like University of Massachusetts is nowhere a low rank university, but my advisor um, had a, a reputation and a way of working with his students and, and all of those things that had a much bigger impact on my career than just the university would have. And I've seen sort of the flip side of this also as a postdoc at UW, for example, where students often show up there because of the rank without necessarily having a match with the advisor. And often they try to switch advisors or get stranded or and leave the program or just struggle with their PhD, right? Um, and, and, and so, so it ends up being really, really important who your advisor is. Uh, in terms of professional impact, I think in, in sort of faculty market circuits, there may still be a correlation, but even a causation perhaps from where you go. Uh, but in my experience in industry, I don't see much. Uh, your advisor would matter a lot more after a PhD. Of course, people who are in industry can, can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think I, I think I completely agree with what Samir said. Um, the only uh, maybe nuance that I would add there is that this is assuming that whoever is evaluating you, who's deciding whether to give you the job or not, um, are entities who are plugged in to the AI research community, right? Where they even have the signal of which uh, advisors have been doing, which labs have been doing good work and which ones haven't. Um, if you are, if you find yourself applying for positions where that evaluating entity is not plugged into the AI research community, then I think um, ranks will make a difference to be honest, because that's kind of all they have then, right? Because they don't have additional signal. I mean, of course, in addition to your CV and all of that, but when we're talking about uh, factors outside of your application, um, so I think that's the distinction that I would make. But any 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 entity that is plugged into the community, I do think the reputation of the advisor uh, matters quite a bit more than the rank of the university. Thanks. And following up on that, do any of you see trade-offs if you have good advisors, good departments, but outside of CS, which are also engaging in machine learning research? Maybe James might have some thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great question. So as we said, that especially for machine learning, there are lots of great groups um, that are either partly in CS or even in other departments. Uh, for example, HEMA is also affiliated with the business school at Harvard. We are a part of the, the medical school at Stanford. Um, a lot of the statistics professors at Stanford also work with machine learning researchers. Uh, students in computer science. So I think there's an increasing trend where across different universities, the boundaries between different departments is becoming quite porous, but to the extent that after you're admitted to a university, at least at Stanford and many of the schools I've been through, that um, it matters very little of which department you're admitted through, but once you're here, then you can actually work and collaborate quite flexibly with students and with faculties across different departments. Um, so that makes it, I think, quite nice for the students. Uh, so then they do have a broader network of potential mentors and collaborators. Um, that, that, uh, I think that also means that perhaps at the, the admissions time when we are applying for schools, it's also for, good for the students to, to also look at maybe some of the adjacent faculties in relevant departments. Um, it could be statistics, could be data science, um, then see what are potentially some cross uh, overlap there. 
Yeah, and I think uh, James kind of covered a lot of the ground there, but I would also, given the questions that we got, I would also like to just explicitly put out the names of the departments that typically also hire ML students. So for example, uh, James talked about the biomedical data science departments, uh, and then I guess analogous departments like biomedical informatics at Harvard, for example, and I'm also sure other schools, stats departments, E or EC departments, uh, all of these. So roughly you can think of it as like business schools, medical schools, uh, stats departments and electrical engineering departments and also operations research departments. So these are, I think, roughly all the other non-CS departments that are also looking very actively for uh, machine learning PhD students. And uh, as James also brought up, like most of these faculties, like I did my PhD in computer science in Stanford and the research that I do is very closely related to CS. In fact, like mostly I publish in ML conferences. Uh, so yeah, it would not really make a, a huge difference in terms of the work that you do or the kind of the research that you can work on. And of course, you always have the opportunity to potentially collaborate with uh, other uh, you know, faculty also in different departments and things like that. So I think it is, I personally have new students who I recruited last year and have joined this year. And so far they are really enjoying, and these are serious students who have uh, joined the business school PhD program and they're like really enjoying the experience, just having more access to, let's say some of the applied perspective by the professors at business school and so on. So I think, uh, yeah, those are all the variety of options that are potentially available and one should not really limit themselves to just applying to the CS departments for sure. Right, and perhaps something that's not so well known is that oftentimes the other departments, especially the non-engineering departments do offer better funding support for their PhD students than in computer science. For example, at Stanford, these departments like biomedical data science statistics or uh, with business school, they actually fully support you by the department. That means that if you're here, you are very valuable to all the faculties because they all want to work with you because you're fully supported and funded for. Uh, whereas you know, for many for the engineering schools, this is the faculty have to pay you out of, uh, you know, from year one, right? So that's, it's something that maybe that's not so widely known, but it's actually great to learn about the funding structures for different departments. Yeah, no, thanks, James, for bringing that up. And in fact, like my own students, I recruit from both CS department and business school, and they ask me, so what's the difference? And I'm like, well, one set of people is just funded by the school, and they can literally work with whoever they want. So they, they're, you know, yeah, they're pretty free, like neither have I to pay them or like, you know, they're completely independent in terms of funding. So yeah, that's one of the biggest difference that the school funds them, and they're not really tied to one advisor. Thanks. Yeah, so um, another very pertinent question uh, that's anonymous is how is COVID going to affect the current admission cycle uh, 21 in terms of how many students you're hiring and uh, will you account for any bad grades in the past year or any lack of research experience that they lost out on due to this pandemic? I think at least for Stanford, I don't think we foresee dramatic changes in admissions. I know for a fact that, for example, the engineering school supported fellowships are continuing at the same level. Um, there are slight increases in deferrals from last year, which I think will, might affect um, the overall sort of target number of people we admit, but I think it's very minor. Um, it should basically be the same as usual. And with regard to things like grades, um, you'll be compared to basically the pool of other people who have also had the same issue. Um, and if you're concerned about COVID related sort of issues on your grades, we do have a column where you can sort of write in sort of issues that you've had. And also you can put that in your statement and they'll of course be considered. Um, sort of, we try to take into account these kinds of issues as much as we can um, whenever they're sort of explicitly spelled out. If you don't tell us, then we can't know, but otherwise. I guess one thing I'll add is that uh, with this COVID stuff, since everything has become virtual, I think earlier I used to see engagement with the research community as one of the factors, but I could understand traveling all the way to Canada every year for New Rips or something is, is not something that's easy for everyone to do, but the barrier has lowered significantly. Um, and so if despite this lowered barrier, uh, I, I, I don't see research engagement with the research community, then it, it sort of it is more of a signal now than it used to be. 
Okay. And I will uh, add it just that's right. to see things from the other side. I think one um, effect of COVID, at least in my view, is the big unknown. So there are things that we still don't know. Um, and then one thing, for instance, we don't know how many people would apply. Um, like I've heard people saying that maybe there will not be that many applications because some people would prefer to take a gap year as opposed to being in this virtual setting. Um, and so it's sort of an unknown all around. It's not only that it's the same number of applications as before, but now how people are evaluated. It could be, I don't know, and that there will be in fact fewer applications. Okay, so I guess we'll take one last um, audience question. Um, Gautam, uh, oh. you can ask a question. You've been unmuted. Uh, thanks everyone for your great insights. Uh, my name is Gautam. I'm currently a master's student at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, my background is in mechanical engineering, both in master's and undergrad. But being at Carnegie Mellon kind of evolved my research interest towards robotics and ML. And I have worked in ML and uh, published as well. How would something like this be viewed where my degree is actually in something else, but my experience is in something else? I will just briefly react to it that I personally see it as a positive. Um, I don't know if that's the traditional view, but I really um, appreciate interdisciplinary collaboration and I appreciate people who being trained in one field, um, manage to do research in another and bringing the different perspective that in your case, mechanical engineering and robotics machine learning would offer. So in my world, it will be a plus. Okay, great. I think to be respectful of the panelists' time, if you have other engagements, please feel free to uh, leave. And um, Ema and I would be staying around. And if any of you are also available to answer more questions, please feel to stick around as well. And thanks yeah, to all. Happy the to stay around for much longer. Yeah. Thanks, James. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today and giving your valuable time for this discussion. Hopefully, the attendees also got a lot out of this. Thanks, Hima and Aditya, for organizing this. This is really great. Yeah, I want to chime in again. This was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Devi. OK. OK, so I guess we can take another upvoted audience question by Nathaniel. Uh, Nathaniel, I'll just allow you to speak. Hi, professors. Yeah, thank you for saving your time for this webinar. I really appreciate it. My question was, uh, what advice do you have for students who uh, have focused more on breadth in their undergraduate studies? For example, like uh, have two majors, some minors, have focused on like uh, personal projects or student groups versus undergraduates who have focused on their depth. For example, like taking graduate courses or published research. Uh, for example, I view undergraduate as a time to explore breathwise, whereas PhD is more a time to learn how to be an un independent researcher. How to how do your how do you view this and how do like the uh, admissions committees view this? I think this is an area where I think depending on the reader, as sort of James was saying, people sort of split very much on their value of breadth versus depth. Um, I think at least for me, and I know at least for several other people, um, the thing we're really looking for is research potential and sort of, you know, if you achieve everything that you can, like, are you going to be a great researcher? Um, and breadth actually does factor into that in my mind in that, you know, it gives you different perspectives. And if you're, you know, you've done a lot of humanities, maybe you'll be better at, you know, thinking about fairness and machine learning and things like that. Um, and so I do definitely look at that. And on the other hand, I sort of think, um, you know, in order for you to, you know, be ready to be able to do, you know, PhD level research, you know, how much more courses do you need to take? So I sort of look at that and I ask, you know, is the breadth versus depth, you know, that trade off, how does it compare to the other applicants? Um, and I think, you know, if you can make a compelling case that, you know, you are, you know, you have some depth and your breath is just so overwhelming that it's going to be really great for your research. You know, that's sort of the case that I'm sort of looking for in these kinds of applicants. I agree that there's this tension between breath and depth. I mean, when, I, when I was an undergrad, I was uh, like a math and English double major. So it's more focused on the breath side. 
Um, I do think that currently how most of the missions committees will view this would be, I think there's probably a preference towards depth over breadth, at least to the extent that, you know, if you, it would be useful if you can at least take some of your class projects to the next level of making it into like a workshop submission or we'll put it on the archive to show something that you can, to demonstrate this research potential where you can you know, take something from the start to finish. Um, I think that would, that would help to alleviate perhaps some of the concerns that people might have about someone just taking a lot of classes or having breadth, but not demonstrating the research potential. Thank you. Next, we have a, an interesting question from the attendees. How important is age a factor in the PhD application process? I would just say that I never look at that. Um, I don't even know where it is on the <laughs> application. Um, so yeah, for, would, for us, I, it's not. Yeah, I was gonna say the same that I don't think that's, um, yeah, I don't think that would be a factor. Great. Um, another question we have from an anonymous attendee is, how many potential PIs do you recommend mentioning in the statement and how? I could answer that briefly. Um, I think really mentioning people whom you would want to work with is useful. Um, and it doesn't have to be an entire story, but maybe something like I would like to work with X because of their work on Y and Z because of their work on. So like just very brief, um, to know that you are actually aware, you are just not listing random names. Um, and it's also fine if you want, like I would also be to have a more general statement, like I would also be interested to work with other people um, who do research in like, I don't know, whatever would be that area or, or space. And, but I think it's important to have, because that shows that you are moving beyond generic. You don't have just this application sending across to all departments, but you've actually done your homework and you know why you are applying to this particular place. Like who are the people that you would want to work with? So having that kind of um, specific statement on some people you would want to work with is important. And it doesn't mean that you are limited to those people. Um, in our case, there are other people who look at applications regardless of being name or not. Yeah, and it, this doesn't feel, at least uh, in my opinion, this doesn't feel like a thing that needs to be optimized, that if you really are interested in working with seven different people, I think it's okay to list them and, and list why you're interested. If you're only interested in working with one person there, it's fine to list one person and say why. I don't think it's that if it's three or four, then that's just right, and more is too many or fewer is too less. I think whatever it is that you're interested in, just stating that I think would be fine. I don't think it would have a positive or negative um, reaction to that. Great. Uh, so next, we'll take an audience question from Haynes. Uh, Haynes, if you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, it seems Haynes is no longer on the call, but I can ask the question for Haynes. So Haynes is from Germany, and he wants to know the process by which the PID application process differs in US. So in Germany, it's common that you apply to a very specific lab. And Haynes is wondering that if you get in, accepted to a program or university, but you do not get the lab of your choice, uh, should you still continue to opt for that university or look at other places? I think you can make the US application process much more like the Germany one if you just write in your statement that this is the person you want to work for and this is the one person you would like to work for um, at least when we're doing um, at least in the NLP group when we're reading files we send, definitely send the files to people that the you know the applicant says they're interested in and we ask you know would you be interested in taking this person and so if you very narrowly specified your goals and your desired advisor like that will definitely be reflected um, I think this gives a little bit more optionality in case you don't have a very specific advisor in mind. Yeah, I, I, I want to say that there is a variance in this across institutions. So there are some institutions that will just admit students as a batch of students, and there might be a rotation program where you spend time working with different faculty. And it might not be till the end of your first year where you're expected to have sort of a commitment from an advisor and figure out who you're working with. Whereas there are other universities where more or less from day one, 
there is an implied connection that this is most likely the person you're working with. If things don't work out, you might, you can obviously change advisors, but there is a default assumption that this is probably what's going to happen. Um, so I do think there is variance around that. It's not all the same across uh, US institutions. Um, this, it, like some of this, I feel like you can also just get more signal after you've applied and then you can talk to more, like once you're admitted, there are going to be more people who are also willing to spend time talking to you. Um, and so you can also just get more signal after the application process once you've been admitted, um, talking to various faculty and getting a sense for who you may or may not most likely work with. And then if it feels like, no, like there isn't enough of a commitment yet from the group that you're interested in, um, it could make sense to then rather go with a place where you are more comfortable with who you will be working with and there's more certainty. Okay, so I'll ask one final question. This is for everyone in, on the panel. Uh, so this is one of the pre-summit questions, which is what are one or two or three things you can do during a PhD to make it a great PhD? Uh, so maybe we can start with James. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, no, I think having a good core group of peers um, that you're surrounded by, I think that's really going probably the most important factor of your PhD experience, even more than your PI. I, you know, I learned more from my students, uh, my fellow students when I have PhD students. And I think these are, just, these are the people that you have the, your daily interaction with. Right? So that's something you want to consider is when you visit different groups, different departments, and think about what is the culture of the individual groups, right? Are this the kinds of fellow PhD students like people that you want to spend you know, eight, six, 10 hours a day with, do you want to work with them on different projects? And a part of that is thinking about how collaborative the other students and group members are, right? Do they often work together on papers? They publish papers together, uh, or is it a lot of sort of single people working individually on their projects? I, I think that actually makes a big difference in, um, in, in, in my and in other people's PhD experience. Thanks, Samir. Um, I would say, I think, um, try not to follow what, what the sort of trend, what the trend is or what the hot topic right now is. Um, I think sometimes, and, and you can even uh, put your advisor to task if they do that, but uh, it's really important to figure out research topics that you are excited about, you find fun, and you think are important, right? And, and those may not align with what the rest of the community thinks. Uh, and that I think is is probably uh, my my um, my suggestion. Thanks, Samir. Devi. Yeah, I was going to say something very similar to what Samir was saying. That I think um, not getting sort of overwhelmed with like these are all the papers on archive. This is what's happening these days. This is the hottest topic, and taking the time to think about what is it that you genuinely get excited about where you where you are interested in putting in the time and effort and thinking about things um, and going after that, even if it's not the hottest thing right now, um, I think is um, is a way of just on average being happier during your PhD. Um, and I think it can also have a strategic advantage, right? That if the different things that you're trying do end up being interesting and you end up writing papers on it, it's easier to stand out, right? If there are a million papers on tweaks to transformers for NLP right now, um, and if you do something different, you can actually get uh, the community's attention. So it's also strategically potentially of, uh, of uh, benefit um, to just think about what you're excited about and work on that. Thanks. Radha? So I would say it's, um, it's important to be engaged, acknowledging that it's harder to be engaged during these times, but this is just temporary period and will eventually be back to normal. Um, and that could mean what James was saying, like really engaging with your peers. Like if there is an option of working from home or working from the office, I would choose to go to the school. So you actually maybe meet new people when you go and grab a cup of tea or coffee um, and talk to other peers. Um, I would also say um, keeping an open mind and looking what the place where you are has to offer, not only in your immediate um, research area, but more broadly, maybe other departments have fun events or there are lectures being offered and other things. So really taking advantage of the place where you are spending about four or five years um, of your life. And, um, and on that note, also this 
taking advantage of those years, like look at what are experiences that would be maybe specific during a PhD. Like for instance, having the opportunity to teach, um, even if it's not a requirement, I always in encourage, and it's almost like a requirement in my lab to teach at least once during a PhD, because that's a unique opportunity to figure out if you enjoy that. Um, taking initiatives, I think it's also part of that, making a PhD a great experience. So if you want to start a reading group because you are really interested in a topic, which doesn't even have to be your immediate dissertation topic, go for it. And like trying to create this community of scholars and contributing to that, I think it's, um, it's important and makes it really fun and enjoyable. Thanks, uh, Tatsu. Uh, sure. Um, I'll, I want to sort of say I really strongly agree with what James said that, you know, your collaborators and colleagues and your friends, you know, student friends are really a huge asset in graduate school. Um, but I don't really want to repeat that point. So I'll say something else, which is um, sort of coming to grips with the really long tailed nature of sort of research success and the amount of failure that you'll encounter. Like you don't see this externally, right? But research is really just a series of continual failures until you eventually, hopefully, get a success. Um, and people don't really tell you that uh, when you start. And so you need to just like calibrate yourself to the amount of continual sort of disappointment that you'll face. Or at least it took me a very long adjustment coming from school, where you know you solve your problem set and you get a hundred and you're very happy. It's very different from that. Um, and the other thing is that's related is sort of external validation and just sort of trying to sort of tune that out because you'll sort of see your peers um, sort of, you know, achieving great things and you'll just get sad that you're not, you know, moving at the same pace or whatever. And that's just really unhealthy. And I paradoxically, I think, did my best research once I sort of gave up on these kinds of things and said, I'm just going to do, you know, solve the puzzles that I'm interested in and stop thinking about awards or whatever. Um, because, you know, it was really unhealthy for me to sort of think in that sort of goal oriented kind of way. Um, so those are the two things that I think uh, sort of mental health wise, um, I really want to try to emphasize for PhD. Thanks, Ima. Yeah, I would say one of the most important things I realized was like, keep an open mind. Uh, for example, let's say you came in thinking that, oh, I'm going to work on this particular topic in NLP or something, but then you realize that you're getting more and more fascinated by, you know, say research at the intersection of ML and social sciences. I think this is too specific because it happened to me. Uh, so yeah, don't feel worried or like uh, hesitant about exploring your interests because Grad school is also an opportunity to do that, right? So don't be like, oh, I came in for maybe ML and NLP and that's all that I should do. And like, don't kind of put yourself in uh, boxes like that. So I would say like, just keep an open mind. Uh, and I think it's just, uh, this has probably been highlighted by a lot of people, but I just also want to mention that it's extremely important to have uh, healthy habits and just, you know, have a good friend circle around who can support you as you go through this journey, because there could be a lot of lows as several of you have already pointed out. And in those phases, I think it would be great to have a friend circle who can pat your back and say, this is temporary, uh, this is just a temporary setback and you know things would get better. It's very important to have uh, those kinds of people around you. And while comparing oneself to everything else or everyone else, uh, everyone else's best uh, foot forward as you might uh, see either on social media or elsewhere is almost alluring. Uh, don't do it because it's just not very healthy for, as Tatsu said, your own mental health or for your own, uh, you know, sanity. Uh, so again, taking care of mental and physical health is extremely important as you go through this journey. Thanks. One thing which I'd like to say is, yeah, there's a lot of uncertainties during a PhD, like a lot of panelists have mentioned, you go through lots of ups and downs. And um, one should really embrace the uncertainties. So as machine learning tells us, you should be optimistic in the face of uncertainty. I think if you follow that philosophy, uh, I know it's easier said than done, but if you're able to follow that philosophy, it's going to be a great PhD. So with that, I would like to thank all our panelists for uh, spending so much time with us answering these questions and also our attendees for contributing these questions and making it a great discussion overall. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we are now going to close the webinar and let you all go and do whatever you were doing uh, before we distracted you with this, but hopefully this was useful. Thank you so much.